It's my great pleasure to welcome conductor Christopher Warren Green back to Minnesota for performances this coming weekend of Handel's Messiah with the Minnesota Orchestra and Minnesota Chorale. Christopher, I've had the joy of preparing this work for you several times and have always loved the musical and historical insights you bring to Messiah. When and where did you first experience Messiah? Oh, when I was a small boy, I was a chorister from the age of seven. So, of course, parts of the Messiah came into my life all the time. And when I was an adult and I started, first studied it to um, perform it with an orchestra and uh, of course, I realized that I knew so much of it and it was in my blood from a, a, a very early age. Um, it, it's just probably one of the iconic uh, works of all time. There's just so much, you know, and you never, never tire of it. I mean, 51 years I'm celebrating as a professional musician this year, and I've been conducting the Messiah. Oh, I don't know. Well, the first one I did in Minnesota was 21 years ago, so that tells you how many uh, times I've been conducting the Messiah. But it is just one of the greatest works. I've never, ever had an opportunity um, to invite a young person to the Messiah for the first time. So I've had the opportunity, but I've never had the occasion where they went away saying that they weren't blown away. That's wonderful. So you started off as a child singing the work, and then you played it in the orchestra as a violinist, and then you led it as a conductor. So you've really seen it from all perspectives. Yes. Backwards, sideways, <laughs> all over the place. The Victorian versions with the great big choirs and, and the Mozart version with the trombones, which is I mean, because it's Mozart's uh, orchestration, it's quite incredible. Um, but I've stuck with the, um, well, it's not quite original, is it? Because in fact, Handel didn't write any woodwind parts for it. There's only one number where he wrote the woodwind parts. So, um, but it's close to what would have been heard in Handel's day, let's put it that way. Steve, what are some of the special moments that audiences should listen for or that are very dear to you? You know, people, I think, get blown away by the Hallelujah Chorus, but, you know, and rejoice the soprano aria, which is famous. But moments in I Know That My Redeemer Liveth and other poignant moments in the piece that are really quite aggressive and dark. Actually, the version that I do is close to the Foundling Hospital version, but then I add things like The Lord Gave the Word and uh, other popular numbers because there's so much in there. That I think the nativity scene is is one of the most magical parts for me, very exciting, when that starts with the um, what is known as the PIFA, which is a symphony, a rustic um, sort of country band, really, playing as shepherds abide in the fields. It's the story of... Uh, the nativity, which is why it's so poignant at Christmas. And yet, I often think we used to do it more at Easter in England, uh, traditionally. But here in the States, it's usually done in um, at Christmas time, which actually, speaking of the foundling hospital, if I may, um, if I may speak too much, I mean, <laughs> um, I've often wandered around the foundling hospital in London. It's still there. You can, oh. if you're ever in London, you can go to Bloomsbury Square, you know, it's where Peter Pan arrived, you know, um, and the uh, arcades of the Foundling Hospital are still there. And I think what makes Handel so special is that he got together with Thomas Coram, and in fact, the Foundling Hospital is in Coram Fields. Thomas Coram was a ship's captain. We're not even sure that he might have been a slaver who um, felt you know, uh, absolutely destitute about what he'd done and so turned to charitable works. And he, with Handel, Thomas Coram, the ship's captain, Handel and um, Hogarth got together, the painter got together, and they started the Foundling Hospital for the children of prisoners, because part of the punishment for a prisoner in those days, jolly place, old, merry old England, you know, part of the punishment was they you stuck the prisoner in prison and the wife and children get thrown out on the street. Oh. Lovely stuff. Um, so Handel was a very spiritual man and uh, he decided this wasn't good enough. So what they did with the family hospital, probably many people know this, but uh, it would be a place where the mothers could take their babies and they would leave them on the steps and the foundlings would be taken care of and looked after. And uh, 
But I think the key to the Messiah spiritually is in the first performance in Fishamble Street in Dublin, uh, which preceded the London first performance. And um, there were many aristocratic people in Ireland at that time, Irish aristocrats. Um, one of them was Lord Canoe. And at the end of uh, Handel's entertainment, as they all thought it was, he went to Handel and he said, uh, yes, um, a most noble entertainment, uh, Handel. And Handel's reply was, which was uh, risky to a lofty lord in those days, he said, entertainment, my lord, I should be sorry if that's all it was. I wish to make them better. And that's the message of the Messiah. So, you know, as I say in rehearsals, whether you are religious or not, whether your your God is one God or another God, what, or, or you have no God, this piece really speaks to the heart in the right way, in the right spirit, in the spirituality. And actually, strangely enough, I find that of all the great composers, all of them, Mahler, Beethoven, Brahm, and all of them, Mozart especially, their most heartrending and, and amazing works, for me, were written for the church, or written for the kind of spirituality that a sacred oratorio is. Um, I could don't uh, I could go on for hours. <laughs> I know you could. I won't. Just you don't have the time. Share with our audience. Um, Handel conducted this or over uh, supervised over thirty five performances during his lifetime. Is that true? Yes, he, he conducted so many different versions as well, with so many different types of soloists. Um, I, I always use a countertenor for the piece. I like the quality of the countertenor. I like the drama of it. But he, oh, also, this is an interesting point about Handel. He broke so many um, uh, rules, if you like. Um, he cast actors in the singing roles. Mrs. Kibble who sang the uh, contralto part, was an actress. And this was at a time when actors weren't even buried in consecrated ground. And he did this because he wanted the drama of the actors in this piece. He wanted everything explained to people so it would make them better. And there was a particularly uh, pompous priest in the first performance, I might have been London, I can't remember, where Mrs. Kibble sang this. And she sang... He was despised it. And when she finished, he said, the priest said, for this woman, all your sins are absolved. Yeah, I, I mean, crikey. So uh, I think Handel was an extraordinary person from that point of view, I really do. Yes, and you reminded the chorus numerous times last night that he was an opera composer. And so the drama of the work and the power and the message are very direct. Oh, very, absolutely dramatic. And he wrote for what was not the Royal Opera House at that time. It, was, and it wasn't where it is now. Uh, it was in the Haymarket. Um, it was the Italian opera. That's, an, that's why a lot of uh, Handel stuff is in Italian. Jennings, the librettist, thought that Handel hadn't done a good job on his Messiah. <laughs> I think he did a pretty good job. Um, but, you know, Handel, I mean, his house, again, for people, when you're visiting London, his house is uh, still in, uh, I think it's near Bond Street Station anyway. And it's right next to Jimi Hendrix's flat, funny enough. Um, who'd have thought Handel and Jimi Hendrix shared an apartment? Um, but <laughs> they, uh, the, the house is still there. The bottom floor is a shop, unfortunately, but it's still got this amazing architrave at the top. And this was the shop where Handel sold his sheet music. And upstairs, is a room there, a little organ and a desk, in this really dark room where he composed all this stuff. He composed the Messiah, all of that, in 22 to 24 days. And while he was at it, he hung, hung a soprano out of a first story window by her ankles because she wouldn't sing the way he wanted her to. He oh, had a bit yeah. of a tempo, you see. Yes, soprani, beware. <laughs> this can happen. Can you imagine doing that nowadays? <laughs> Getting oh. hold of someone by the ankles and holding them out of the window. He was a very big man too, but a good, a good man, extraordinary man. Well, we're so grateful for your time and for your skill and for your passion in presenting and preparing this Messiah with us. And we can't wait for the concerts. 
So thank you so much for sharing a few insights and background about the work. And we look forward to seeing all of our listeners today in the audience on Friday and Saturday at Orchestra Hall. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you.